Hello, and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today I have as my guest, Denise Champagne. He is the founder of Lotus Communication. He is a practicing Buddhist. He's uh, spent the last 14 years, 15 years, working directly in the role of prospecting, opening doors for clients. He's also really uh, developed a form of coaching uh, within organizations that liberate salespeople from poor targeting. He's uh, helped them to overcome their need to get away from metrics and focus on what actually drives motivation and to turn habitual, phenomenal performance into a pattern of behavior. So without any further ado, Denis, welcome. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you so much. I really look forward to this. So would you mind giving the audience maybe 60 seconds on your history, please? Well, I'm a former squash professional in my early career, an indoor racket sports professional in, in Canada. And after that, I got involved in selling. Someone thought that I would have <laughs> the drive or the grit to engage people over the phone. In those days, in the 80s and 90s, it was a phone. And subsequent to that, I built my own company, a call center, did that for 10 years, and then got into corporate communications and prospecting as you show it, you talked about. Okay. So you've had an interesting history, and you said that it was largely the gristle and the mud and the blood, the sweat, the tears that's formed you. So talk to me about that journey, because I think far too few people really appreciate the value of a good kicking on a regular basis. Obviously, when you start up your own business, because I didn't think that I was going to be the best employee, although I did my best, but there was something that was unfitting or unbefitting for me to be subject to accountability to someone else when I could do the same myself. So in 1989, after arriving in Montreal from leaving Toronto, I decided to start up my own agency in selling racket sports. Actually, it was um, some product, Ascot Rackets from England, were the products that I was going to represent here in Canada. And then the deal didn't come through. So someone who had seen me as the McGill University squash team coach uh, during our event of the prizes and the awards ceremony happened to be someone that I had trained in a call center in Toronto way back a few years. And he said, and it really resounded with me. He says, I've been, I had heard that you had moved to Montreal. And I remember you, the way you worked in the office and how you behaved. And it struck with me. And I said, if any time in the future I can have an opportunity, I'd like to connect with you. So the message here is people are watching you. Even though you may seem unobvious, people are watching. And so everything you do and say has an impact. Someone may take note and eventually get back to you. So that taught me a lesson, and that got me into a partnership, a business partnership for 10 years in a call center that we ran together. We did very well in transactional sales. And then I decided to move on to corporate communications. Back in the days, it was corporate CD-ROM. A CD-ROM was the way to give a tool. Instead of a brochure, it was a talking CD-ROM with video and macro media and vectorial flash and all of those technologies to enhance communications corporately. So I did that for a few years. And then I got into prospecting because so many companies had no one involved, joyfully involved in the top of funnel. Uh, I I say joyfully because most people view it as drab and a drag. And uh, it's really the fun part because that's when you discover, you know, talk about the word discovery. Uh, Inherently, prospecting is the true discovery. You discover them, they discover you. And so, yes, from 2006 to about 2019, 18, I focused mostly on opening doors and opening hearts and minds. So thinking about the mindset, I'm really curious, before you pick up phone to call, 
or a headset nowadays, I guess. But before you uh, dial, what's going through your mind? What's your expectation? What's your intent? Is to just make the other person resoundfully respond, not re react to my call. I remember in my call center, I used to have a team of sellers in the evening for fundraising for charity. And I remember a gentleman that I had called in part of the city in the evening to raise money for a charity. Yeah. The gentleman said to me something that always stayed with me afterwards. And it was kind of a, almost a modus operandi for me. And modus vivenzi, actually, is he said, your prospect's reaction is your attitude. And I said, wow, what a revelation. His response or reaction is your attitude. And that brought me to open my heart and my mind to Zig Ziglar. And Zig Ziglar spoke very strongly about the power because in those days, the phone was omnipresent and it was probably the only tool, the only tech stack <laughs> that we had. So we had a lot of practice. And if you were not able to engage calmly and with respect and trust, to calmly reassure the person, because people are really keenly aware of your voice without them realizing it themselves. Can I trust this voice, this vibe, the vibration of your voice? So Zig Ziglar said, probably the most important factor in improving your closing percentages has to do with the use of your voice and to practice it. So it was very important to me to understand that when I call someone, I want to calm them down and not make them feel as I'm coming after them, but coming to them with as a humble servant kind of curiously, caringly, interested in serving if there is a problem that I have studied or identified that are most likely to occur in your company. Whether it is in existence or not, we will find out. Sometimes I do my research that I know for a fact through PR websites or during your research. And that is part of my methodology, as I told you. Deep research caring research before. So you come with a very strong business case in the forefront. So yeah, it's about calming and reassuring the person. And you can tell, you can tell, if you pay attention, you can tell the person feels, yeah, how, how and they, I asked them. I asked, actually, I have a, a 10 second methodology or trick or I could approach. I could say. So let's say you answer the phone and I will, you know. Hello, Marcus Kauke. Mr. Kauke. Hello. Marcus Kauke? Yes. Oh, hi, Mr. Kauke. Dennis, on behalf of Lotus Communications, how have you been, sir? I'm good, thank you. Right. Do I know you? So, yes, and that's right. So if you ask back to me, how am I? That is an open door for a conversation. Okay. So I've noticed that I've mentioned your name three times. And nothing is more important. Nothing, yeah. nothing is more important to you, Marcus, than Marcus Kauke. Okay. That's a very basic Dale Carnegie. And I, I was eight times a Dale Carnegie graduate assistant since 95. So mm -hmm. I remember the power, the omnipotency of a person's name. Please, let's remember people's names are the sweetest sound to their ear in their own language, not in your language. So Denis is my name, not Dennis. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And happily, enough people are sensitive to my name now. But I have many that say, hey, Dennis, and I correct them. And they say, oh, I'm so sorry, because they realize that it's important to them, their name. And I really appreciated that you got my name right from the off, because that's about the second time in my life that it's happened. So it will stand out. That makes you memorable. But also, I, I think far too few people really think of the customer as a human being. When you turn up, whether you're at their office, knocking on their door, uh, making a call, invading their space uh, through your tedious uh, digital advertising or whatever, if you don't show up and turn up in a timely and relevant fashion, deliver value and leave them wiser, you've just been an interruption. And 
that's a very selfish occupation. But it's certainly the one that I see most people in leadership and management encouraging. And to me, that smacks of something uh, gone sour. My friend Simon Bowen says that selling should be the most noble thing you do in your business. And I, I agree. The job of a seller is to facilitate the best possible decision for the buyer, whether they buy from you or not. And it's to make them feel safer having you with them than without them. Now, if you don't start out that way, you're already on the back foot. So, Denise, tell me this. Once you've managed to create that uh, moment of engagement where they're asking you a question, what is it you're trying to do next? Well, as to bring relevance as quickly as possible, within the first 10, 15 seconds afterwards, there has to be something that resonates in, ah, this person understands my situation. Okay, so this then points back to something further upstream, which is targeting. Because with the wrong targeting, it doesn't matter how good you are at prospecting, you're still only going to be like you know, a broken clock. You might be lucky twice a day, but that seems to be an enormous waste of eight hours and 59 minutes and 58 seconds. So let's start with the targeting piece before we th uh, move on. How do we target effectively? Well, uh, first of all, target your own motivation. I, I, when I talk about my team's model, by the way, which is T-E-A-M-M-S, which is my, my sales model or my prospecting model, T is about 50% of the work. We don't spend enough time targeting correctly. Uh, mm -hmm. When I decided in 2006 to qualify for the world championships in master's track cycling in my age bracket, I did two world championships, and um, I spent more of the time planning with my coach our program. It was six days a week, every month, for 11 and a half months, for five years. So the goal is to be three years down the road qualifying. So it wasn't something that I took lightly. So same thing with targeting. If we don't spend enough time planning correctly, preparing correctly. Have you heard of PPPPP? Proper preparation prevents poor performance? Uh, well, I use six Ps. It's the slightly coarser version. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Prior planning prevents piss poor performance. Yes, exactly. Well, that's very naturally good for you. I mean, it fits for you. Uh, my, my dad was in the military, so that's where I learned that one from. <laughs> that's nice. It's, it's okay. It's, it gets the message across, that's for sure. <laughs> So targeting is about targeting your own heart, targeting your own motivation, targeting, uh, be clear in, your, in the job. Why are you in sales? Not take it lightly. So once you have that clear out of the way, any and all future and ulterior initials, uh, initiatives will be a lot more clear to you because you always have to go back as I work with a client, you know, if there is a misunderstanding at some point, I always go back to what's the goal again? What were the three objectives we set at the beginning? And it brings people back to the basics. In squash, as a professional player, Jahangir Khan taught me that seek to be an expert in the basics. You can never fail. Uh, again, this is fantastic advice. And the mantra is do the basics well consistently over time and mean it. And all the time, look for ways to compete with yourself. The, the mistake people make is the complacency. And I learned from uh, uh, Rahul Chahan, uh, a wonderful model, which is a 70-20-10. 70% love your existing customers, work them as best you can, stay relevant, timely, be valuable. 20% is the innovation piece. So that's the, uh, the next iteration. What am I going to sell the 70% next? And then 10% attacking yourself because at some point, someone's going to come in and either commoditize or make you irrelevant. So if you haven't got that plan, then you're in deep trouble. And I think from a salesperson's perspective, you need to think like that, because that's how customers need to think. And I think if you come in and you just pedal product and you're a feature monkey, you just have no relevance or value. True. Okay. 
So talk to me about the rest of this team's model, because now you've got- oh, the Target, team. Target, it also has to do with more than 60% of our prospects are not really clearly a good fit for our solutions. So we need to make sure that this product market fit exercise is a really seriously taken to the extreme, like push for the clarity, the relevance, and almost like seek to confirm and validate that. So in your curiously caring approach, when you prospect someone, you really want to make sure that you care about that. I don't want to continue this conversation, Mr. or Mrs. Prospect, because parenthetically, I'm not sure that I can help you. And I don't want to just waste your time. And they will appreciate that. They will appreciate that more than trying to make a fit a square peg in a round hole. And there are far too many who are trying to make it fit where there is no fit. One of the principles of how to avoid stress in life and stop worrying and start living, a book from Dale Carnegie, he says, learn to accept the inevitable. <laughs> that will calm you down. So, and joyfully and respectfully say, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. You may say, and by the way, has anything of what I said seems to re resonate for someone that you may know that may be in a position to appreciate this? That kind of, he or she, depending on how you've created the context, of course, again, going back to the initial establishment in the first 10 seconds. This really speaks to something that's, that's so embedded and ingrained in sales culture and sales management culture and sales leadership culture and the thinking is that you've got to do things in a way that requires some penitence, some suffering, because I'm a big fan of cold calling done well. And it is one tool in your mix of ways of engaging with and uh, customers and prospects, but also the intelligence gathering, because I think people undervalue the value of cold calling for gathering intelligence about your marketplace. Almost nothing is quicker than having 20, 30 conversations with people in the space and then learning from them, because they'll teach you how to sell. But we need to start thinking more intelligently. One of the questions that is bothering me that isn't being asked is, how do I turn these highly trained, highly skilled people who have this rare capability of being able to engage with strangers on the phone? And how do I get them to spend 80% of their time doing that instead of 99% instead of, of it talking to voicemail? How do I stop them wasting time on dead activity? Well, first of all, let's stop talking about the numbers game and play more for the quality game. Absolutely. For me, I spend less time talking, but every time I talk, there's more traction, if you want to. And the word traction comes from the word attraction. So to attract, yeah. create traction, means that the, the, the rail is holding the wheels of the train. It's on the rail. You're not derailing from the value of your work. So to the extent that you spend a bit more time preparing, and less in execution at the beginning, but that you execute when you execute, you have feedback based on the right benchmark and the, be the best, I guess, parameters that you set for yourself. That's where the targeting, the preparation and the targeting comes into play. So when you call, you are predisposed for success because you've done everything to enhance the possibilities, to increase the possibilities and the probabilities. And when that happens, there's nothing more joyful than calling someone and when he or she responds and they say, yeah, actually we, we are just in the middle of doing that and it has been on our agenda. You feel elation, you feel so useful, you feel so relevant, you feel so Useful is really the word. Instrumental is the word. And that gives you a lot of self-confidence because, and you calm down because you don't have to deal with the uncertainty because he or she has validated that your call was worth it. So if you don't prepare and you don't get the worthy validation, you just create self-doubt. 
and self-doubt in your hearts are going to affect your voice, the way in which you approach someone, the willingness to lift the phone in moments of precarity or, you know, dubiousness. You're not sure. So that's what I think is lacking, is we don't prepare well enough. I had not, had I not prepared six days a week for years, I would not have gotten my silver medal at the Pan Am Championships in a moment of unrest at 34 degrees Celsius in the sun of Cuba on a velodrome that's very, very, very hot. Yeah. I could have cooked eggs on the roof of my little, where I hid under the shade. So same thing with the best calls I've made. There's so much joy in it. Not just because you think that you can earn income, but you earn income because you help the outcome. The income is a byproduct. This is why, again, uh, in the interview with Na uh, Nadia Komanec a couple of weeks back, what was really interesting was how the realization that money is not the motivator. Metrics are not the motivator. Mo metrics don't motivate almost anyone that I know. What they do is they create undue pressure. You want the outcome, you want the result. But I, I think far too often, solutions are paid for without really thinking about the real consequences of having purchased them and the result that you want. Training being a classic example. There are so many different stakeholders in buying training. You've got the poor SAP users who end up having to sit through some uh, weird ed edutrainment being fed from a fire hose. You have the managers who send their people on training because they want them fixed. You have L&D who are more interested in how much they remember than whether or not the needle moves. HR, who is probably looking at how much work is going to be on their plate, uh, having to replace a third of those people or half of those people within six months. And then you've got leadership that is saying to their shareholders, we're going to do an impossible number. And then you've got finance bleating along the way as well. And all of them have different vested interests, and none of them are focused on the one outcome, which is, does it make our sales improve? Yeah. Well, there is the ebbing house forgetting curve. Have you, have you ever heard that? Tell the audience about it, because they may not be familiar with it. Well, it's, it's really a, a concept that, over time, there's a tendency to forget more and more. Imagine that we only retain a very small percentage of it, so that training or coaching, in my opinion, is more training than coaching. Uh, it's more coaching than training, sorry, because coaching changes behavior, and that's what we want, versus training is more of the sharing of the information. Well, this really speaks to another very important factor here, which is that most managers who think they coach don't coach. They do a lot of telling and hero, um, you know, playing the hero. But the reality is, unless you galvanize the middle management layer to deliver operational coaching, which means coaching on the job in the moment at the point of need, the coaching is never going to happen because the traditional model of grow requires privacy. It requires a safe space. It requires time. That doesn't work for managers. It works for executives. That's great. But managers need something that's down and dirty. They can roll up their sleeves and then they can help their people so that they're not always the bottleneck. They're not the ones solving the problem. But next to no money or effort is placed on those people. They get about 3% of the global training budget. Correct. And that goes back to the mindset I talked about earlier with the upper management who don't understand they need education. And education, the goal of education from my mentor, or one of my mentors in Japan, uh, Tsune Saburu Makiguchi, who was a philosopher and a geographer who wrote a book called The Geography of Life, spoke about education being the purpose of education is appreciation. So to the extent that appreciation comes from the word appreciate, appreciate means a price, give it a price, give it a value. Precious means a precious stone is a diamond, right? It has value. So the purpose of upper management is to give everything that's necessary to your team, your soldiers, to be the best trained soldiers. Uh, appreciate, ascribe value, exactly. It's upper management need to take on a paradigm shift. I think there are some people who need to change their position, and we need new leaders. 
as someone has told me, a yeah. paradigm shift. But we're not going to get into that because I believe that, you know, being myself a boomer, uh, admittedly so, I learn from the younger trainers and coaches. Uh, I'm impressed with the intelligence, the emotional intelligence, the far too many times technical intelligence, mm -hmm. but there are people who care. And it, it's got to come to a decision that you want to do well in this. There's no merit in just accumulating you know, material wealth. When you hit my age, you start looking back. You say, did I create value? Did, did I make a difference in people's lives? And so it's a value-based decision. But um, for sure, there are smart, young, caring people out there that are, and we need to nurture that, you and I, given our... our uh, Fender of blades. <laughs> so okay, carry on with team. So, so T is team. targeting. T is targeting. E, obviously, is execution. Because without execution, there's nothing. Of course. So once you've spent a lot of time, you're prepared, you've gone through the crafting of various messaging, narratives, discourse pieces that you can naturally integrate in you. You don't want to make people robots. You want to make them caring, professional, knowledgeable salespeople. So they must be able to express that. That why is practicing is the key. Practicing is the key. So again, I couldn't agree more, but one of the things that flabbergasts me is the number of times people go on training and then there's no practice, there's no reinforcement, and coaching needs practice as well. One of the things that, uh, again, I, you know, full disclosure, I, I work with this company and I've deliberately gone out and courted uh, working with them because unless the skill is practiced and practiced and practiced repeatedly in a safe environment in multiple different ways, you're not really going to get mastery of that skill. And what's really important about operational coaching is what you're doing is you're taking a moment in time or a moment of communication in the sale where I see a salesperson maybe tripping over when they're talking about money or a price increase or introducing a new product or selling something that maybe we're not known for and we're trying to displace an incumbent, where they struggle with those moments. They need to practice that stuff. And it's unfair of senior management to assume that these people are born into this stuff. No one pops out their mother's womb and bang, all of a sudden you're able to, you know, to sell. What you can do when you pop out your mother's womb is scream, vomit, and poo a lot. That's what you could come out with. There is no such thing as a, a natural born salesperson. It is an acquired skill. It's learned. Now, you may have a propensity, but you need to invest in your people. And they have a really difficult job. And throwing them to the wolves is irresponsible. I mean, it goes beyond that. It's immoral. But the irresponsibility and the waste of your shareholders' money is well, the, the irresponsibility is the blinded, blindness, outright blindness of the upper management to not see that sales really at the very end of the day is the revenue-producing machine. Yeah. Why would you disparagely not consider? I've had discussions with executives. So, well, we can't fit it into the budget. I say... Let's look at how you're budgeting because between putting money into my coaching and getting the proper nutritional kind of counseling about my eating to attain the best performance on track on my bike and the training on the gym with a coach that's going to teach me how to squat and deadlift and overhead press and bench press properly to be super strong. Okay. Uh, if I'm not getting investing in that, even I remember Brian Orser back in the 1980s, late 80s, when I was a squash coach in a club. And Brian Orser was the reigning world figure skating champion and came to the gym. And I had uh, on the squash court a little game with him to help him. He says, I've decided to put more money into my sports psychologist in preparation for the world, world mm -hmm. championships. Then, and he was like Brian Boitano another American figure skater and him were in heads to heads to become the world champion in figure skating. And figure skating is extremely intense. Uh, he spent 
more of his budget on sports psychology to prepare his mind. So in sales, we disparage. We we I did something about infantry soldiers <laughs> that rem- reminds me of the, the terrain soldiers, the sales rep, and we put the hands of young people with with or without a, a university degree to call on to executives mm. and call on directors when they're they haven't even had their belly button dried up yet. Yeah, they are look they're accountable for bringing that to a conversation where do they get the training it is irresponsible there are so many management upper management teams who are begrudgingly or disparagingly not training their reps the way they should and could i just i'm blown away by that I, I, i'm lucky I, I, I have clients i am i'm lucky i have clients actually after this our interview with you, I have a call with my client where I start four new reps in South America. And they have with me held two years now. I've been training these people. The results are there, but it's the people, every single rep I coach are not taught the same way. The problems we talk about, yes, but they are unique in their discourse and narrative. So I'm really curious what happens when you hand over those reps to their managers how the managers are then taking on the mantle of coach. Well, I had lunch yesterday with the manager who's from South America, who happens to be in Canada for this week and goes back to Sacramento, California, where he lives and back and forth. And I said, you and I are going to have weekly calls now. Every Friday morning, we're going to have an accountability report. And I'm going to tell you what has been so you can observe carefully during the week the changes and validate or invalidate those changes as you see them through time, because it's a 10-week program with me. This is really interesting. So one of the companies that I work with, Mobile Practice, has developed an app precisely for that purpose, because what we're trying to do is find a way to get people to practice those moments so that they appropriate those skills, but also to create a measurable, tangible return on effort, as well as investment. Because every time they practice, and then they eventually save the recording, it might only be 30 seconds or two minutes, but they can see their own progress. And we know this because on average, it takes four or five takes before they save it. Now, what that tells you is they become more aware of their own performance. And that's really critical because you need to see yourself being able to use this stuff for you to implement it. Otherwise, you don't have the courage to try it. And you need to be able to coach through the manager. So you as the coach can coach the manager, shadow coaching, on how they coach their people. You've spoken exactly, you're reading my mind. I know you're very, uh, very attached to and and kind of insensitive to that, uh, Marcus. I was about to say that, that I've included in my project the financing for the hours I spend with the coach so that every week, I subtly, in a very kind way, encourage, encourage means to give courage to the coach, the trainer, the salesman manager, who is going to be there after I am no longer there, to adopt a mindset and make it his or her own, so that he will be also coached indirectly in the way I'm thinking so that he can start thinking of himself as a coach and not just a manager, because as you know, there are accountability factors, but he's very, very positive. I I had a very good call with him and a good lunch and uh, he's super excited about having me on. So that, that just in and of itself, the fact that he creates an air of expectancy for the success of his team. And we will all, he and I together, We will take care of our people, really care for the reps, because repping and selling is not an easy task. There are so many different unpredictable issues and components that to create a funnel of caring and support and drive like those tennis players, especially those Ukrainian tennis players at the Indian Wells, Indian Wells Open Tennis Championships right now are dealing with short of not having a caring coach, I can just imagine how it is with their families in Ukraine, parenthetically, of course. 
But so you need that. You often need a coach when things are going more difficult, but you need them also when they're going well. Absolutely, because that's probably where you start getting complacent. I was uh, coaching one of my clients today, and last year, the stuff that we embedded that really made them successful, he stopped doing because he was being successful, and he paid the price for it. Now what we've done is we've created a spreadsheet to uh, identify how much that cost him, because it's 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 a luxury for his ego. If he wants to take the easy course, it's going to cost him £42,000. So he can do it, but he knows there's a price attached, and that's what it's going to cost. In fact, this this year, it'll cost him double that because his sales have doubled, so it's going to cost him (laughs) £84,000. Yes. Well, coming back to the team's process, so the target, the execution, you get the looping feedback and you continue to reinforce that. A is another thing that is missing grossingly in sales processes is accountable for activity, which means the number one tech stack that is being misused and neglected is the CRM. The CRM is your dynamic database and system of record for everything that you have done with someone. How negligent is it to not properly populate the information with integrity which means in the moment where you're executing the task that you populate that information right away so that you can retain and really preserve properly the the integrity of the information based on the activity in the moment. Because if you wait two hours, you will only have about 50% of the information fresh in your mind. That's why Zig Ziglar would always say, Isn't it the best moment to make a decision that when it's fresh in your mind? Because if we go back and we come back in two days, you will have forgotten everything. Is there anything else that I have missed in the information you need to make a proper decision today? Yeah. That was his one of his closes. And it's true, but it's logical. So T E A. M is measure. Measuring means to assess, to analyze, to decipher to infer, to seek to understand, to appraise, to assess, to evaluate the information you just populated. In other words, if you say the person asked to call back in two weeks, what are your thoughts on what he or she says? What the person says and what the person is saying. And how they say it. Are two things, and how you say it as well. So you have to be listening with a capital L to that person. So that's measure. And M, the other M, is manage, which means to run it, to administer it, to conduct it, to use it correctly. So M. And the last one is S for success. Success means what does it mean to you? So you go back to the T. So the S is attached to the T. I go back as a loop feedback and say, the targets I had set for myself, did I attain them? So it's a loop, T-E-A-M-M-S. Target, execute, account for activity, measure to manage successfully. And at the end of the day, prospecting is a team's effort, poetically speaking. Manage successfully. So given the challenges that are coming down the pipe beginning of Q2 2022. What one bit of advice would you give to a salesperson who is looking down the barrel of a tumultuous market, lots of uncertainty? How do they keep clear about the difference between rejection and refusal? Rejection is something that is for the personal ego, it has nothing to do with you as a person. They don't know you. If you look at refusal as an offer, if you offered something and they refuse the offer, that's it. There's not a rejection. If your wife says, we can no longer live together, that's rejection. (laughs) Because they know enough. They have enough information to decide this no longer 
It's like a CD-ROM that ejects the actual CD inside the reader. There's some anomaly. There's something that doesn't match. So rejection is more of a personal, very intrinsic to you. Refusal is an objective view. So, oh, okay, that person refuses. Then you may want to, if you have that posture of proper preparation in your work, and you've targeted correctly your work, I've, I, I was refused yesterday. I had two refusals yesterday, mm-hmm. two emails from someone who, after consideration, I question the seriousness of their consideration, which is what I want to challenge a little bit, to make sure that they're, they're crystal clear on their decision. I have no problem with people who are not, at this moment, predisposed to engage in the purchasing, because we have to look at selling as a buying cycle, not as a selling cycle. Absolutely. We spend too much time on the selling and not on the buying. We are in a process of helping people buy. We should be their partner in buying. So we have to understand their journey. Very few people really know how to buy properly. So I always challenge the buying decision and not so much what I did or did not do because I care enough about them. Make sure that you're clear on this decision now. So rejection is really for someone who doesn't understand that the, and probably they didn't do a good job enough and they haven't put their attention to their job. So rejection versus refusal, I try to always look at it. And why did they refuse the offer I placed in front of them versus they don't like me? I'm not worthy. Those kinds of, you know, dark, negative, not useful thoughts are not going to help you get ahead. Mm-hmm. You play a tennis match or play a squash match and you lose, well, then you have to ask yourself what happened. But we spend too much time on the negative. Talk about win-loss yeah. reviews in sales. We don't spend enough time. Ken McLaughlin from Australia, yeah, a brilliant guy. He says, spend more, because he does win-loss reviews. And he says, spend more time on win reviews. Let's look at what we did well and to continue to replicate the pattern of success, not replicate the pattern and focus. That which you focus on amplifies. So it's it's better to focus on the wins and replicate the winning patterns. Pancho Gonzalez, a great tennis player, he says, I decided to focus on my strengths and not on my weaknesses. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mindset. Denise, sadly, we've come to time. I have to jump on to another call, which I'm heartbroken about because I could talk to you for hours. How can people get a hold of you? Well, Denis, D-E-N-I-S, champagne like the bubbly stuff on LinkedIn. Lotus.com, L-O-T-U-S-C-O-M-M.com, my website. And uh, those are the best two ways. Uh, so if you had a golden ticket and you could go back and you could whisper in the ear of the idiot Denis, age 23, what one piece of advice would you give him? Seek a mentor early in life. That's good advice. Really good advice. A mentor that you care about, that knows, that cares about you. Yeah, it it has to be two-way because that that kind of relationship is incredibly intense and very intimate. You, you can't have tr- uh, trust without intimacy. Correct. Excellent. Denise Champagne, thank you so much. This has been brilliant. Thank you, Marcus. It's, uh, I hope we will we'll repeat this at some we point. We will. We will. We will. Definitely. So this is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you've enjoyed this conversation, God knows if you haven't, you're dead. Then please like, comment, share, and tag somebody who could benefit from it particularly senior management who really need to wake up about managing the top of the funnel, the targeting piece, really critical. And then coaching, real coaching, not this half-assed attempt at telling people and pretending it's coaching. So in the meantime, if you want to get hold of me, Marcus at laughs-last.com. Take care. Bye-bye.